want to talk to you about uh, honeycomb fragments today. Um, there's a bunch of information on this screen. Don't worry, I'll put it up again at the end so you can get it all. You no need to scribble right now. Um, by all means, uh, chat it up in the uh, in the chat room. I'll try to pay attention. I'm going to be um, following my own my own uh, slides here, so I may not get everything, but I'll try the best my best to uh, pick up any questions you have. What we're going to talk about today is fragments. Here's the um, uh, high-level view of what I want to tell you today. Um, first, have a look at, at the fragments, uh, look at some essentials. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take two applications. Um, I'm going to use them pretty much interchangeably, but they're very similar applications, so it shouldn't, uh, uh, switching back and forth between them shouldn't cause too much problem. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that single application and build it little by little into a more complex application that actually makes use of dynamic fragments. So the first step, fragments, just let's have a look at them, see what they are. So first I want to say something about fragments themselves. They're moderately complex. They're, they're easily, well, certainly in sort of terms of everyday stuff. If you go digging into weird devices and stuff like that, you can come up against other complex uh, parts of, of Android. But just in terms of, of everyday things that you might have to do in the future, uh, fragments are, are by far the, the most complex thing you'll come across. If, and, and the question is, if you're going to introduce that much complexity, uh, what's the point? Um, the problem is that, that with tablets, the, the screen layout is much bigger than on a phone. And whereas it, in, on a phone, the sort of stack of cards metaphor, the idea that each new thing that you are looking at uh, appears on top of the, the previous thing and completely covers it, that's not so much useful anymore because you've got so much space that what you'd really like to do is see your context, for instance, a list on the left, and see the, the selection, the detail from the selection on the right. So that, and, and that's what fragments allow you to do. Here, let's try that. There's the slide I want. Okay, so a fragment is like a view in that it appears in the view hierarchy. You attach it just like you do any, well, in a, in a, a manner that's analogous to that that you use to attach any other view. Um, it hangs in the view hierarchy and you can see it as part of your view hierarchy. But it's also like an activity. It has a life cycle, just like an activity. And the, the, so the thing on the left is the um, life cycle of, uh, of an activity, and it should be familiar to you if you've done any uh, um, Android programming. The thing on the right, as you can see, it's a moderately more complex, and that's the life cycle of a fragment. If you actually uh, screw up your eyeballs and look real close at the slide, you can see that, they're, that they have many things in common. In fact, they don't implement the same interface. They're not identical, but, but they're very similar. Okay, so let's talk about uh, fragment essentials. So here's a fragment. This is what I was talking about. The thing on the left is uh, a fragment, uh, is, the, is a list. For it. This is a simple contact viewer. This application is a simple contact viewer. The thing on the left is a list of contacts. Um, and the thing on the right is the detail of the selected contact. Um, so here's the layout for a fragment. It, it should look pretty familiar. The only part that, that's new is the uh, fragment tag. The second element in this XML document is a fragment tag. And it has the, the um, exact class name of the fragment that will, use, that will appear on your screen when you, when you um, explode this, this uh, layout, when you inflate it. This is, I, I call these static fragments because they're defined in the layout document, not in the, uh, well, as you'll see late, later, there's a, a dynamic version. And here's the code that implements this fragment. I hope this is big enough for you to see. It's pretty straightforward. So this is how you use a fragment. 
uh, and this is utterly trivial. It should be completely familiar to you. Um, the, the, all you do is inflate the layout. Okay, so when you inflate the layout, um, when you inflate the layout, your fragment will suddenly appear. So uh, next slide, please. This is the implementation of the fragment. Um, it's pretty straightforward. There's, uh, this, is, this is a little bit simpler than the one in the preceding slide. It, uh, the, the, the fragment that was shown there showed details about a contact. This one just shows a date. Um, it's got a method, an onCreate method that's reminiscent of an activity onCreate method. It's an, a fragment is a managed object just like, a, like a, an activity. The onCreate view is going to be the one that, that's most important to you. Um, it, it's the one that publishes the view that, that hangs in the view tree, the view hierarchy for this, uh, for this fragment. And notice that the, that the view creates, that this fragment creates its own view just normally by, by inflating a layout. And I'd like to call your attention to the, um, to the, the sort of near the bottom, the bottom third there, there's a, a line that says, uh, there's a comment that says this is important. That false is very important. So when, when you inflate a, a view, um, you have to pass in the parent view for this view because in order for Android to correctly lay out the, the, the new view, the view that it's creating, you imagine, for instance, a relative layout where the layout of this new view depends on the sizes of the views that are already in the parent view, right? So when you add the new view, it's important that you, that, that you have, uh, that, that Android has access to the parent view so that it can lay things out. Now usually when you do the layout, you're going to attach that view right away. Immediately you're going to attach the view. So what happens is you do the layout, um, Android figures out the, the, you know, the size of the new view, and it actually installs it in the parent view at that time. Since fragments, the fragment is a managed object and it manages its view, the fragment manages the view, it's important that, that on create view return the view instead of actually installing it in the parent. And that false right there is what's necessary to make sure that um, during the inflation, the new view isn't installed um, in the parent view right away. So here's what's important. Here's what you have to do to make a fragment. Um, you have to have, so, so that layout named a specific class. Um, that class has to exist in your, um, in your application, and it must be public. If it's uh, private or an internal class or something like that, uh, Android won't be able to find it and inflate it. Second, it has to subclass fragment. Okay, so, the, so your fragment class has to be a sub subclass of fragment. Okay. Google recommends no explicit constructors. Um, I'll, I'll say more about why that is in a second. And um, it's interesting to note that the Eclipse plugin could check every single one of those three preceding conditions, but it doesn't. Too bad. Maybe one of you will get uh, excited after this, uh, after this talk and, and write the plugin that does that. So next, I want to talk to you about recovering state. The problem is that just like any other um, piece of, uh, just like any other managed object, a fragment can be destroyed behind your back. So if you think of the case where, um, for instance, you get an incoming phone call and the phone screen covers, the, the, covers your application, the, your application is no longer visible and Android knows that and it's free to actually completely destroy your activity completely garbage collect it if it needs memory. So the, your, your fragment can just go away. The problem is that when, you're, when the phone call is over and you, and you close the, the, the preceding, the, the overlay screen, the phone screen, your application needs to reappear. So if it's going to reappear, it needs to reconstruct itself. So it needs to keep its state. I mean, you can imagine how annoying it would be 
if, um, if for instance, you were uh, looking at your web browser and 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 browsing some, uh, I, I don't know, you know, looking at Engadget or something like that, and you took a phone call, and when you at the end of the phone call, when you dismissed the phone call, all of a sudden you were back on your home page instead of looking at Engadget anymore. That would be a serious drag. Um, just, um, just the same way, you you want your application to retra retain, pardon me, retain its state. So, just as with an activity, um, a fragment implements uh, the. the it has two methods that help you recover state. The first one is um, is unsaved instant state, and that's that's the one that's called by Android before it um, before it, it destroys your 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 fragment, and it it passes a bundle, and a bundle is just a little way. Uh, it's just a place for you to keep notes, right? It's a little notepad, so. You need to be able to serialize, that is, represent um, in in bundle state every all of your fragment state. Um, that can be pretty complicated, I suppose, if you have um, lots of things to remember. But um, and and you do have to be able to serialize it. You can't just put a Java object. Well, you can't easily put just put a Java object in there. You're going to have to serialize into strings and and numbers and things like that. So, um, but th that same bundle, that exact same. If if Android is forced to destroy your fragment when it recovers it, it will pass that exact same bundle in the um, in the onCreate method, and that will give you a chance to to restore all of the state that you lost when the, when the object was, when the, when the fragment was destroyed. And here I show how to do that. So you just check the incoming state. If it's null, you give yourself a default. You set up a default, your default state. And if you have, uh, if you have been passed a bundle, you recover your state from the bundle. It's important that you, um, that you give yourself a default state if you aren't past any, because as you can, as you remember, this this fragment might have been created from the from, um, when the view was inflated. Remember back there when the when you know the, one of the first slides I showed you that the the view gets inflated automatically, and that happens entirely behind your back. You you don't get any control of what's going on there. So so. You need to be able to make sure that your your fragment does something sensible, even if um, it's not past any state. So that's the reason for that for the default. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about dynamic fragments. So so far, what we've been looking at is the static ones. That's uh, those are fine. Those are uh, certainly interesting. They're certainly useful, but it's going to be much more interesting to create one on the fly. Here's the layout for a dynamic fragment. Actually, it's a layout for two of them. And the um, Fragments in the in the applications that, that we saw before those were all those were all static. Now the important thing to remember here, and it's hard to see, but there's a there's a an exception in there quoted. Um, I think the slide got got stamped on a little bit when we tried to fit it uh, to this screen. But there's a if you ever try to mix. A, a dynamic fragment with a static fragment, and as I say, we'll look more at the dynamic fragments in a second. But um, if you ever try to mix them, that is, if you ever try to replace a static fragment with a dynamic fragment, you'll get this error. Just don't ever do it. Don't ever mix dynamic and static fragments. So here's the dynamic fragment layout again. Actually, as I said, two of them. So 
all we've done here is we've replaced the fragment tag with a frame layout tag, okay? And that frame layout tag is just a placeholder. We'll use it in a second. Here's the code for creating a dynamic fragment. Have a look at that for a minute. So this is fairly, this is, this is, um, this is about as simple as it gets. This is the skeleton for hand creating a dynamic fragment. The steps are pretty straightforward. You have to do several things. First, get the fragment manager, then get a transaction from the manager. In this case, we've got two fragments, so we add them both, <coughs> and then we commit the transaction. So there are some things to, to note about this. It's possible that the fragment already exists. Now, now, um, we sort of came at this another way a minute ago, but the, the idea is that if, you're, if your application was destroyed because it was invisible, because, you know, the Android needed memory or something like that, then when it comes back, Android is re going to recreate these fragments for you. It's going to try to recreate the exact fragments, and it's going to try to um, recreate their state. And it's going to do that automatically behind your back. Exactly. Good question. <laughs> what values do frag one tag and frag two have? have? Um, they're defined up above. They turn out to be just strings. Um, they are uh, probably public static final constants. They're strings. And all they are is unique identifiers. Android guarantees that there will only be one fragment with that, uh, with that tag associated during the life of your application, okay? So that means that, that regardless of what that tag is, as I say, it happens to be a private static final or a public static final string, regardless of what that tag is, there's only one fragment with that tag. So when I check to see if that if there is already a fragment associated with that tag, if it was created by, the, by Android to restore the state, then I don't create a new, a new fragment. If, if, that is to say, if it's already there, don't create a new one. If it's not already there, then I have to create it. And that's what that code does. This is boilerplate. You'll use it all the time. As I say, it's important to note that those fragment tags are unique. That's, that's uh, very valuable. So just to recap, here's how you use a dynamic fragment. First, you get the fragment manager from the context. You get a, tra you get a transaction from the fragment manager. You modify the fragment, and then you commit it. And just as you would expect, everything that happens in that commit happens all at once. And here's the big deal. Backstack backs out the entire transaction at once, okay? So if you create 47 new fragments and then your user hits the back button, all 47 of them disappear at once. Now, I don't really recommend creating 47 fragments, but that's the deal. This should, be, this should be familiar to everybody. We're going to talk for a minute now about how to update the fragments. This is going to happen in the, in the context of that, the application that I showed earlier on um, that, that views, that's a simple contact viewer. If you click a new list item, that is you click a new person in the left-hand list, then you want that new person to show up in the right-hand fragment. So you want to update the fragment in place. You're going to replace the old fragment with a new fragment. And here's the boilerplate to do, for doing that. Um, you should all recognize this. This is how you handle a, a button click. And here's the code that does the, uh, that handles the button click. Okay. Look at that for a second while I move ahead. This is the behavior for the button. And again, it looks just like installing a new fragment. Get the fragment manager, get a transaction from the manager. In this case, replace those two fragments. And 
then commit the transaction. You'll see that the replace uses that fragment tag again. That guarantees that there's a unique, that, that, that just, you know, retains that, that idea that there's a unique fragment attached to that tag. So now we replace the fragment that used to be associated with that tag with a new fragment that's now associated with that tag. And once again, we're all set. There's a single tag per fragment. It's just the new fragment. So now let's uh, look a little bit closer at those transactions. So I said earlier that Google recommended that you not use a constructor on a fragment. And you can see the reason for that. Um, if, a, if the fragment is built behind your back, if, when, uh, if for a, what I'm calling a static fragment, the fragment is built at a, at a point that you can't even see, it's built when the, when the um, layout is inflated, then there's no way that Android is going to guess what arguments it should pass to your fragment. So that means that the fragment has to have at least a noargs constructor. Right? So it's possible that it could have a no args constructor and a constructor that took args. Um, that's certainly a possibility. But the thing is that Google wants to retain, uh, retain the ability to, uh, they, they don't guarantee that the state of a fragment is consistent until onCreateView is called, actually until onCreate is called. So what, what they're saying is that the, that the object might itself be in an inconsistent state. Since it's a managed object, if you try to get at the object ahead of the, the Android subsystem, you're going to be able to do things that, that um, the subsystem doesn't ex that, that, that Android doesn't expect. So they don't want you messing with the object until they're through with it, okay, until they've run it through their lifecycle states. So they'd like you not to use a constructor. The thing is that you're, there are times that you're going to have to pass arguments. You need to pass arguments to your fragment. And here's how you do it. You use something called a static constructor. So it's a static method that belongs to the class. And this is an example of it. The, this, my fragment here is called date time. And that static method right there returns a new instance of date time. Right now it takes an argument that is the, date, the, date, the time that you want to pass, the time that you want the, the uh, fragment to display in this case, and it, it uses a, a, a little trick to pass that argument into the fragment. Fragments have two methods, get arguments and set arguments. They're kind of funny. Um, they take a bundle, uh, exactly the same kind of bundle that you would have used for, to, to recover state, as we saw above. And the, the fragment calls get arguments to find the arguments that were passed to it at, by someone calling set arguments. So what the static constructor does is just as, as if it were marshalling state. Um, so, Johan, that's actually uh, the same thing, a factory method, a static, a static factory method. Um, check it out. It's called static constructor. Um, Johan uh, suggests that you could call this a factory method, and he's absolutely correct. It is a, a factory method. Um, it, it's a specific kind of uh, factory method that is sometimes called a static constructor. And what it does is it sets up this bundle it, exactly as if it were recovering state for the fragment and, um, and, and marshals it into a bundle and then sets that bundle as the set argument. Okay, then if we look in the next slide here, this is the fragment initializing itself. So we're setting up on create again. This is another change to the on create method. And the first thing we do is look to see if this is a, a new fragment that has been 
has been created, and so the get arguments returns a value. Okay, so if the static constructor was used to build this fragment, then the get arguments method will return something, and if it does, you can see that this on create will use that bundle that it got from get arguments to initialize itself. On the other hand, it does what it has always done, which is recover state if if it hasn't if there's no initialization arguments from get arg available from get arguments and finally as a last resort it uses a default value this is this is uh, once again boilerplate you should probably do this with all of your fragments build a, a static constructor for them that that um, initializes all of the variables just all of its uh, state just as if it were uh, recovering that state and also set, uh, and also be sure that the thing can have a default value, that it can initialize itself with a default value just in case it's created without behind your back. So let's have another look at that code. This is the, uh, this is the um, method that was called by on click. So when I push the button, so here, we see that instead of, of creating a new fragment as we did last time, we, said we used the new, we used uh, Java's new method to create the new fragment. Now we're using the static constructor, okay? What this does is it guarantees that both of those fragments will have the same time, okay? In the previous, in the previous version of this, they might have had different times depending on how long it took to initialize a fragment. Okay, it's uh, kind of a, uh, a trumped up example, but um, it, fits on the, it fits on the slide. <laughs> so the point is that here we create this, a single time and then we pass it to both fragments using that static constructor. The static constructor receives that time, it marshals it into the bundle for that fragment, in this case for each of the fragments, then when the fragment is created, it unmarshals that time, the same time for both fragments, out of the bundle, and uses it to restore its state. So, let's uh, move ahead to talk about passing arguments. Actually, I think this, state is, this slide is incorrect. I think we should be talking about using the ACP now. So, <laughs> uh, this slide got kind of tramped on. I'm sorry about that. Um, if you look at Wikipedia uh, for, for um, usage by, uh, hang on, uh, I see I have a question over here. Uh, exact back to stack null for. Add to back stack. No. Um, let's see. Let's see if I can. You know, I've lost the context. Um, I will. Um, I will. Uh, the, you'll see my uh, email address at the end of this presentation. And if I if I don't uh, if I haven't answered the question by then, by all means, send me email. Uh, and I'll uh, send you an answer. I've lost the context now, and I can't remember what the, I can't remember why I use it. Um, that, that's going, to, what that's going to do is it's going to, um, let's see, it's going to empty the back stack. And honestly, I can't remember why I do it right now. I'll have to, I'll have to look again. So that little blue square, what it actually shows, uh, if you look at Wikipedia, um, and look at the usage of the various, um, the various releases of Android, you'll see that Froyo is, is something like, uh, I don't know, 60, 70 percent of the penetration, and that Honeycomb has practically none. It's something around, uh, I don't know, 2 percent, 3 percent. So, so immediately converting all of your applications to Froyo is or uh, to honeycomb is a really bad idea. It just means that, that nobody will use them. Fortunately, Google realizes that and they've produced this thing called the uh, 
the ACP, the Android Compatibility Library. Uh, it's a library that supports fragments. You can add it to your project, and it supports all of the releases of Android back as far as Donut. And you'll find it in your SDK installation in Extras Android Compatibility V4. It's just a JAR file. The steps for using it are really simple. Um, you just add the library to your project. You put it on, make sure to add it to your build path. You change the target for your uh, application. I, by the way, I recommend that if you're going to use fragments that you develop for Honeycomb. I think it's a really smart idea to use Honeycomb to develop the app and then, backward, then push it backwards. Um, hang on, I'm going to take a question. Can you explain what fragments can do that can't be done by just updating the view? Uh, nothing. The question is, what, what can you do with fragments uh, that you can't do by just updating the view hierarchy yourself? And the answer is, n is nothing. Um, the difference is that the important difference is that the back stack works. Um, you, if you try to do that yourself, it will take a lot of machinery. Um, whereas uh, you can easily imagine an app that, that when you, um, for instance, click on a city, it shows you um, sort of uh, details about the city in one fragment. So suppose there's a left, uh, on the left there's a list of cities, and on the right there's um, a, a fragment that shows you population and uh, average rainfall and things like that about the city, and then beneath it there's another fragment that shows you a map that shows the, where the city is located in the United States. Um, and then you select another city. Now you hit the back button, you're back, you see the previous city and both of the fragments are updated. Okay? That's pretty hard to do all by yourself. If you do it with fragments, it's trivial. So uh, let me get back to this. Uh, add the ACP to your application, put the ACP on the Eclipse build path, change the build target, change all, now you're going to have to fix a bunch of stuff. As soon as you do that, um, you're going to, you're going to see all sorts of red lines in Eclipse. So first you have to fix the broken imports. Then you have to uh, update all the activities. Um, instead of uh, subclassing activity, they now need to subclass fragment activity. And they need to use the support fragment manager instead of the fragment manager. And the reason that they need to do all of these things is that The reason they need to do do things in this order is that if they didn't, if we didn't do this, if you didn't do this, then when you tried to uh, deploy this application on Honeycomb, there'd be name collisions. There'd be name collisions between your between the ACP library and and Honeycomb, which supplies uh, you know classes called Fragment and classes called Fragment Manager, a class called Fragment Manager. So to avoid those name collisions, they had to rename those things. All right, so let's walk through those steps one by one. Oh, sorry. So here you go. This shows adding the, the, the jar into your project. Pretty straightforward stuff. Add the jar to your class path. And now you've got a bunch of broken stuff. So all those red lines, start, with, start by fixing the imports. Each of the imports, any place that it says Android app, change it to say Android support v4 app. That'll do it. Now, any activity that uses fragments, activities that don't use fragments, you don't have to touch them. But any activity that does use fragments, change it to say fragment, change it to subclass fragment activity instead of activity. Okay, do this, do the, if you do the things in this order, um, you won't end up with any mysteries. There are, um, 
If you don't do them in this order, you'll see that there are a bunch of places that you get kind of mysterious error message, uh, messages that are a little bit hard to figure out. And finally, walk through your code in any place that, it's, that you um, use the type fragment manager, change it to say support fragment manager. That should fix all of the red lines. That should fix all of the errors. There you go. You've got a now, now got an app that has covered all the way back to API v, v6. The important thing to remember is that it's not forward compatible. You've, you've tightly bound your, your application now to the ACP. So for instance, if there's a change in the way fragments work in ice cream, you won't see it, all right? Because your application uses that library, and that library is, is part of your application, and, um, and that's all she wrote. So finally, I think we've got a few minutes left. I'd like to talk about fragment layout. So now you've got an application that, that even on, you know, if you run it on a tablet with Froyo, it looks like this, okay? That's all great. So very cool, except if you run it on your phone, it looks like this, and that, that just won't do. So, what you've got now is you've got an application that is um, that will run on any phone. It's compatible to run all the way back to Donut. The problem is that um, it doesn't it, it doesn't look good on, on anything except your uh, except the tablet. So what do we do? Well, there's a trick. Um, there are actually two tricks, but, but I'm going to show you the one. That, this is from uh, uh, this is a, a hack from Diane Hackborn. Um, it turns out that you can have multiple layouts for uh, uh, multiple layouts with the same name. You put them in. It, it turns out that that Android supports. Uh, they're, they're called qualification, configuration qualifiers in the res directory. You simply have um, layouts in, in folders with different names. Um, how they're chosen is really, it, it, most of the time they do what you expect. When they don't, it's kind of tricky. So um, I, I strongly recommend reading the documentation. Um, the, the, this deck and therefore, um, this link are available at, on GitHub, at, uh, and I'll, I'll leave that slide up at the end. Um, so it's, it's definitely important to read the documentation on how the, how the configuration qualifiers are, are chosen. But you can see here, there are multiple directories, each with its own layout, and what we do is this is the layout that you've been using. It has the fragment in it. It has space for the fragment. It has a, a, a placeholder for the fragment. But here's another layout, and it's in the directory that we use when we're in portrait mode, and it doesn't have the fragment. Okay, there's no placeholder here for the fragment. What you do, this is, on, this is the activities on create method. In on create, we simply check to see if that layout element is there. If there's place for the fragment, we create it. If there's no place for the fragment, we just don't. Then, well, this is the code. Yeah, this is the code that that adds the fragment. You can see. This is going to initialize the fragment, but only if it's there. And this is going to stack it. This is the code that goes into the onClick method. 
And all it does is it checks to see whether there's a, let's see, it should check, yeah. And finally, if you're in portrait mode and there is no fragment, and there is no space to put the fragment, you just use the normal, the normal um, intent mechanism to overlay a new fragment on top. Actually, I'm sorry, I misspoke. To just, you start a new activity, all right? So you start a new activity. And you're all set. Portrait orientation, it looks much better. That concludes my presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry about the, um, about the slide mix-up. Um, I don't know what happened there. Um, but, and I'm more than happy to take questions now. I'm also, uh, here's my email address and stuff. Uh, I'm, I'd be more than uh, happy to take questions offline. Um, and by all means, buy this book. It's a, <laughs> it's a good book. <laughs> um, it's pointed right at people who, have, who are competent developers but are either new to Java or new to Android. Um, it will get you um, sort of on the right page, get you in the right place to start um, applying your skills, the skills that you already have from your, your years of developing experience, especially if you're already a mobile developer, to just move into the Android space. I think it'll help a lot. Um, so I've lost track of questions that I should answer. Um, if you want to just type them in on the uh, in the uh, chat, I'll be glad to take any. Okay, Blake, this is Yaz. Real quick here, I did see a question come in. You may have already answered it, but I'll just read it real quick. Um, Pravin asked, can we use one fragment each for each of the tabs? Is this a right use case? So, you know, I don't know about that. I, let me think about that for a second. Um, that, you know, I, I should say, I don't know. That seems reasonable. The, 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 the more I think about it, the more I think that that's probably not what you want to do. So when you, when you click on a tab, that's, that's essentially a new, a new view. And when you, let's see, so I guess what it comes down to is whether you want to use the back stack or not. If, if you want to use the back stack to get to the previous tab, then it seems like a smart idea. If, you, if that's not what you're going to do, if, if the back stack will take you to the previous view, that is to say out of your tab view altogether, then you don't want to use fragments. It seems to me that, the, that when you use tabs, you're sort of choosing what this view is about, what this page is doing for you now. And I think that that's not something you want to do with a fragment. I'm not sure. Give it a try. Give it a try. It, it, it doesn't seem unreasonable. It doesn't seem to, to me to be clear one way or the other. It seems to me that, that there are times that you'd want to use it and times that you might not. Um, I see a question here about uh, interfragment uh, communication. Um, I, I can't, I have to see a use case where you'd want to do that. There are naturally, so a fragment will be in the context of an activity and, and it seems to me that there'd be no problem at all using the activity as a way of, um, of synchronizing data between two fragments. So suppose you have uh, fragment A and fragment B, and fragment A wants to say something to fragment B, so fragment B tells the, uh, the activity, please pass this message on to fragment B, and fragment B does a callback, um, having, you know, having a reference to the fragment. Uh, by the way, one thing that's, that is absolutely a, a developer's friend is um, Control F11 in the, um, in the emulator. 
when you're running the emulator, Control F11 will um, rotate the screen. If you're in, if you're in uh, landscape, it'll ch change it to portrait and vice versa. And what that does is it tells Android, uh, unless you've done something funny, unless you've set your application up otherwise explicitly, it tells Android to run your application through its entire life cycle. Okay? So it will call on pause, it will call on destroy, and then it will call on create again and, and uh, build it. Okay? So Control F11 is a great way to test that your application survives um, you know, uh, running, being run through its life cycle. It's absolutely your friend. You should absolutely <laughs> never turn loose an application without running Control F11 on it a lot. All right? Um, if, as far as interfragment c communication, it's important that you do that because I can easily imagine cases where one fragment says something to the activity and then and then the whole activity is destroyed, along with its fragments, are destroyed and return, and then they're completely out of sync. So you, you want to be careful about things like that. But, but as I say, basically, you should be able to communicate through the, through the activity. I believe Hackborn has a, uh, Diane Hackborn again, who is um, the font of all wisdom uh, when it comes to fragments. I believe that she uh, describes a trick where, um, you can register a fragment with, with something. That you declare an interface and then register the fragment with the fragment implements that interface. And then you register the fragment with uh, the, um, probably the activity. And it checks, it casts the activity into that interface. And if that doesn't work, it, it knows that it's got the wrong thing. It's a, and I believe that it's for exactly that. Uh, I, I'm sorry, that's not a, a great pointer. Um, once again, if you take my uh, email address, I'll be glad to refer you. Um, but there is definitely um, a, a trick out there that uh, Diane got together for, for doing interfragment communication. Sorry for the long-winded answer. Is there anything else that I missed? Well, let's take a peek here. We, Ted um, sent in a question, and he says, is this a good general rule of thumb? If you need back stack navigation for separate parts of the UI, then use fragments. Otherwise, there's no compelling reason to use them. There's, um, there's a, thanks for the question. There's, um, there's a really interesting thing. Um, I don't know if any of you have dealt with async tasks. But async tasks are, are interesting things. They're, uh, they're essentially the way you run something off the UI thread. <clears throat> and they have a number, they're, they're, uh, they're cool, they're interesting, and in their place, they're a valuable tool. Unfortunately, they have a whole lot of problems. And a lot of those problems come from um, exactly what I just described. The, the, the the possibility that your that your activity can be destroyed while this asynchronous task is still running, okay, and and that that can lead you into all sorts of concurrency issues, all sorts of synchronization problems, and so on. There is a thing called a, a, a UI-less fragment. That is to say, a fragment that has no interaction with the that doesn't hang in your view hierarchy. Um, it returns null from on create view. I have just barely started looking into this myself, but it looks to me as if viewless fragments are a great way, because they have a life cycle, it looks to me as if they're a good way to get around the problems, or, or at least I'm exploring them now, as a way to get around the problems with async task. They have a life cycle. They can be stopped. Um, it seems like they might work out for that. Um, I'm investigating that. I think the main reason that you want to use fragments, though, is, is as you say, for the back stack. It's, for, it's, for, uh, it's to have normal navigation work when you have more than one thing on the page. Okay? So if you have multiple, multiple um, 
views on a page, and they're related by context. That is to say, a selection in one of the views is causing something is causing one of the other views to change its content. I think under those circumstances, you almost certainly want to use fragments. Again, sorry for the long-winded answer. I hope that was helpful. Okay, we have one more. Um, this one's from John. John says, I'm wondering about using the compatibility library and being tightly bound to a certain level of Honeycomb OS. Does this mean if Google enhances fragments, say animations, you won't get them? Yes, that's exactly what it means. Um, it's interesting. Um, on one hand, I think this means that there are going to be a lot of people whose apps are, you know, half again the size that you know, um, they would otherwise be. On the, other one, on the other hand, I've heard from people at Google that they intend that the ACP move forward as um, that it al will always be there and it will always contain things that are not in the, the, um, in the Android proper. That is to say that there will always be things available over there that are not available regardless of what version of uh, Android you're using. In the current version of the ACP, they also con contain a thing called a loader. A loader is a, a handy way to manage uh, content providers. Um, and um, both of those things come with the ACP, I think, um, there are, there are, Google is also versioning the ACP, so you can include uh, newer versions of the ACP. All of those are caveats. All of those are, are uh, gentle ways of saying, yeah, exactly. You bind yourself to the ACP. You're stuck with the ACP. When, when your customer downloads your application, they get that application, and that's that. Okay? Anything else? I'm not seeing any additional questions, Blake. <laughs> okay. Either either I was completely confusing or I answered them all. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Great. Um, thank you so much, Blake, for that wonderful and informative presentation. And folks, we do apologize for any technical glitches that happened today. On these live events, you just never know what's going to happen. But we hope that you were able to follow along. Blake did a wonderful job presenting, and we hope you've all benefited from today's webcast. Please mark your calendars. Blake will be presenting another Android webcast for us on September 29th at 10 o'clock Pacific time. You won't want to miss it, and we hope to see you all there. Again, thank you so much, Blake, and thank you all for attending our webcast today.